Bring the Sciences. Uh, I'm your host, Scott Turner. I'm Director of uh, Science uh, Programs here at the National Association of Scholars. And of course, they're the group that also sponsors our webinar. Uh, we have a special guest today. His name is Mark Stallman. He's currently uh, president of the Center for the Study of Digital Life, uh, which we'll have much more to say uh, during the webinar. Uh, but he has quite a long career and a long uh, pedigree in, in past lives. He was a Wall Street uh, technology strategist and banker. Uh, he also has a, an eclectic uh, academic background. He uh, He's trained to be a molecular biologist at University of Wisconsin and studied uh, theology for a time at University of Chicago. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Mark has a very intriguing uh, intellectual pedigree, which I think has informed his thinking on how we deal with the world, how we educate the young, and how technology influences both. Uh, his father, uh, William Stallman, was a historian of ancient mathematics. Uh, he was an expert on Ptolemy, and uh, he was a protege of the remarkable Norbert Wiener at MIT, whose moniker is the father of cybernetics. And I have a feeling we'll be visiting Norbert Wiener quite a lot uh, today as well. Um, a little bit more about uh, the Center for the Study of Digital Life. Uh, uh, among its initiatives, uh, uh, there's a new graduate education initiative, which uh, just launched this summer called Trivium University. And uh, I've posted links both to the Center uh, for the Study of Digital Life and Trivium U in the chat box. So uh, please do have a look at those. Uh, you can get access directly to them through those links. Okay, uh, before we begin, a couple of little housekeeping chores we need to do. Um, we want to make our conversation as inclusive of the audience as possible. So uh, what we'll do today is we'll start things off with a conversation between Mark and me, and this will uh, go on for about 45 minutes or so. And after that, we'll open up the floor to questions and comments from you, the audience. One of the things we can do here, of course, is allow you to uh, ask questions of uh, our guest, and uh, uh, that can uh, uh, usually lead to some very, uh, very interesting and intriguing uh, lines of uh, conversation. Um, <clears throat> you can post your questions at any time during the webinar, starting now, in fact. Uh, we ask you that uh, any questions you have be posted using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we ask you that just because it's a little more interactive than the chat box. Uh, uh, but don't ignore the chat box entirely, though, because we'll be posting some useful links there, as I said. So uh, without further ado, uh, welcome, Mark, to Restoring the Sciences. We're really glad to have you. Scott, thank you very much. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, our uh, initial conversations and um, this invitation uh, to work with you uh, in this seminar um, was a very generous one on your part. Thanks again. Well, we're really glad that you're here. So um, let me start with this whole issue of Trivium University. And of course, uh, when most people hear the word uh, trivium, they tend to uh, think uh, trivial, that is, and there's a quote of a definition, bits of information of little consequence. That's the common definition of it. And and uh, yet the uh, trivium, um, along with uh, other uh, aspects like the quadrivium, we'll have something to say about that. But the trivium is classically the a sort of threefold foundation of classical education. And uh, this was common in the medieval and pre, actually from, from the uh, from the start of uh, the Euro European universities. And, and these were uh, designated as grammar, uh, rhetoric, and logic, which is also called dialectics. And in looking over your website, uh, you have some very interesting things to say about the relationship of those three elements of the trivium. And, and the thing that intrigued me is that that you talk about grammar as a way of um, describing the world. It's not just knowing, you know, how sentences are constructed and those sorts of things. Uh, but in there, in, in the dialectic and uh, in the uh, rhetoric, you have some very interesting things to say about um, about how uh, these are the things that empower free will and agency. And that was really the point 
of, 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 of educating students in the classical system. So um, I'll turn that over to you with that prompt and uh, we'll take it from there. Well, I think it's important to note that the, um, the, the really uh, thorough organization of the trivium, while based upon uh, certainly uh, much older uh, sources, didn't actually come about um, until uh, Charlemagne. And in particular, uh, Charlemagne uh, made a major steps forward in Western education, primarily because he was uh, evangelizing. His uh, appointment uh, as the first uh, Holy Roman Emperor on Christmas Day 800, uh, was a result of work that had already been done in Lombardy. Uh, many have forgotten that in the sweeping um, series of conversions in Europe, uh, Lombardy, uh, today um, we think of Milano uh, as the capital of finance and a capital of fashion, was a pagan um, enclave that had resisted uh, Christianity. And it was Charlemagne and um, actually his son uh, who uh, made that conversion stick. Uh, and uh, then they moved on, in fact, to, um, to the north, uh, to the Saxons and to other uh, pagan tribes. And in fact, what we uh, would now think of as uh, Germany was, was at least partially initially converted by uh, Charlemagne. So in the process of conversion from paganism to Christianity, which has many significant parallels today, in many respects, what has happened in the West has been a reversion to a much more pagan uh, orientation, particularly in the social sciences. So modern social sciences, which radically discarded, fundamentally discarded, the previous social sciences, psychology, sociology, anthropology, history, uh, these were all radically remade in the late 19th, but particularly in the early 20th century. And they were remade in such a fashion that eliminated the cohesion that had previously been oriented to natural law and its relationship to the development of science. The principal reason that I would suggest that this reversion uh, to a uh, a pagan uh, orientation was, uh, as is usual in, in much of, of these situations, an attempt to gain some measure of control over uh, the population. Um, we're, we're, we're all very familiar, I, I would guess, with the uh, work that's been done on the topic of propaganda uh, in particular as an attempt to manipulate the overall population, most closely associated with the medium of radio. Um, there's an enormous amount of um, literature on this topic, perhaps culminating in something that few uh, may be aware of, but might want to look into, the historians who are listening to this, something called the Rockefeller Radio Research Project. He even got his own Wikipedia page. Uh, and this was uh, obviously um, developed in, in part because of the success of uh, Hitler and many others as Europe uh, really had, had fallen under a propagandistic um, uh, theme uh, uh, in the mid to early 20th century. This manipulation of the population by social sciences now needs to be reversed. We have come to the point where many have recognized that in fact, because of agency, because of our free will, which cannot be 
declared out of existence. You, you can't just you can't just simply um, uh, construct a series of experiments and and show that that there's uh, as classically ha has happened here. Show that in in fact it appears that intent um, in terms of, of human actions, uh, moving our fingers and and uh, and beyond, appears to uh, uh, occur chronologically uh, well before it becomes a conscious. Well, that just simply means that there's something beneath the conscious. It means <laughs> there's a subconscious. It just it does not mean that we don't have agency. It just means that agency operates in a way perhaps differently than we had thought. But this um, manipulative effort on the part particularly of social sciences has come to its end game. We're now in a situation where it has become clearer and clearer that human beings cannot be so easily manipulated, that their, their agency uh, and their, uh, their true freedom, which is not the freedom that many would associate with it. So this may be an interesting part of the conversation here, which is to say the, the freedom that we associate in a negative sense from, from restraints is not true freedom. The true freedom is a positive freedom as agency is positive, as in fact free will is positive, but it winds up being positive in terms of the orientation of humanity towards morality. And that orientation towards morality, which no beast has ever expressed, um, which no machine will ever possess, unique to human beings, now needs to be restored. And the, the sciences that will come out of this over the course of the next uh, few decades um, uh, I think are going to be quite remarkable. Uh, everywhere you turn, your work, uh, Scott, is a real hallmark in the difficulties that biology uh, has uh, come to experience. Um, as you know very well, there are many others who seriously doubt uh, Darwinian uh, uh, themes. Um, the Darwinian uh, expression was Darwin himself was somewhat reluctant, uh, but uh, he wound up with uh, his bulldog, T.H. Uh, Huxley, mm -hmm. and others who wanted to uh, really force this through in the late 19th century. This was a, a move to control the population. D Darwin is really um, an anti-human um, uh, exposition, which I, I, I believe he feared is exactly what would, would turn out from all of this. So, but you got on the list. Physics has reached a cul-de-sac. There are no more elementary particles. We're spending large sums of money trying to find them, <laughs> smashing things into each other, but the right. standard model has been in place for 30 years now. Mm. Uh, and, and so you wind up with people effectively making things up. And uh, this goes all the way down the line. Psychology, cognitive psychology has reached its final point. Doesn't work. Yeah. Anthropology has actually removed humans um, from the description of the American Anthropological Association. So uh, with, with all of that um, hitting the wall, uh, in effect, um, we've, we've reached one of those Yogi Berra moments. <laughs> when, when you come to a fork in the road, as Yogi suggested, you take it. <laughs> yes. One direction of the fork of the road of attempting to manipulate and control humans uh, has shifted away from humanity towards machines. So this whole hoopla, hoopla about artificial intelligence is subconsciously a reaction against our ability to comprehend real intelligence. Mm -hmm. So that route, artificial intelligence, is one route. It's a headline-making item. It's a Wall Street uh, hype cycle and so forth. The other fork in the road is for us to retrieve science 
in its earlier basis, which has a natural law um, foundation to it. That is not yet as well funded or as well organized as the robot orientation is, but I believe it will be. Yeah. So, so here we are at, at a real turning point. Yeah. You know, the, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, Darwin and Huxley and one of the uh, intriguing ideas there is that, of course, Darwin himself had a much more nuanced uh, idea of how evolution worked. You know, I, I he had one foot in the classical um, uh, realm. You know, he was uh, he, he was originally training as a clergyman at uh, Cambridge. And uh, Huxley, who was driven more by by political considerations than anything, actually himself had some had some serious doubts about the whole Darwinian idea. But you know that's 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 just leading into this uh, this 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 kind of trend that you see in the history of of Darwinism and evolutionary biology, and in fact in the life sciences altogether. Which is that which is that uh, um, even though Darwin. Darwinism itself was kind of on the rocks at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, no one believed it anymore as the so-called crisis of Darwinism. It was reinvented as uh, as selection of genes, which, of course, uh, uh, Fisher, Haldane, and Wright sort of likened this to the statistical mechanics of, mm. of ga gases. And and you know when you when when you look at the development of the sciences, uh, 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 it seems that the ideal is to be like uh, like um, uh, Democritus, you know, be an atomist, and and one of the things that stands in opposition to that in the life sciences is the notion of agency. You know, living things are intentional; they do things, they have purpose, and so forth. And and one of the subtexts of a whole range of life sciences, and you mentioned a number of them, uh, you know, what's the mind? Uh, uh, is there such a thing as artificial intelligence uh, and so forth? Seems to be centered around uh, what I've called the abolition of, abolition of purpose. You know, we cannot allow living things, if we're going to study them scientifically, to... Um, we can't allow ourselves to think about their most fundamental attribute, and and um, I just wonder if this abolition of purpose ties into what you're just saying that that uh, um, you know we've lost the we've lost the trivium, uh, we've lost the essential element of the trivium, which is to uh, deal with how we perceive the world, how we respond to the world, how we shape the world, and so forth. And and these are things that are very uncomfortable in the modern scientific uh, idea. And how did we lose that? How did we lose that, that, that essence, that willingness to talk about life as something purposeful? How did the trivium enforce it? How did we lose it? Right. Um, well, we lost it when we became modern. And this actually predates um, the social scientific uh, revolution of the 20th century and, and takes us back into the print era. So uh, I will follow many other people um, who have gone down this road. And um, I will, for the purpose of today's conversation, blame it on Descartes. <laughs> um, but Descartes is not the cause. Descartes' dualism, mind-body dualism, um, gave us a, a quite remarkable world, uh, to be sure. But it is very important, and we'll get into this later in the conversation, to recognize that the shift from a, uh, a scribal world into a print world, which is the hallmark in, in technological, formal, causal terms for what we're describing here, the shift to modernism, that didn't happen everywhere. In fact, most importantly for today's situation, it did not happen in China. And the Chinese are very aware of this. So when we say that we need to restore pre-modern science, 
natural law based science, the Chinese never lost it. Hmm. And the principal reason for this is that while we can accurately say that the Chinese invented pretty much everything, including block printing, but block printing was wood blocks. And wood blocks of characters which inherently have meaning. That is not at all the same as assembling in an alphabetic framework a series of symbols that don't have meaning and can be um, obviously radically uh, easily rearranged. And, and uh, so this technological shift towards alphabetic printing, which is not in any way something the Chinese invented. It's a Western invention. That is the beginning of the problem. Probably the best single commentator on these technology-driven social shifts, which we call paradigms, uh, after um, what uh, uh, Thomas Kuhn uh, brought into the language in part, but um, just as a small footnote here, uh, if you do care to go back, because uh, along the way here, one of the things that we lost, and this is fundamental to the problems that we're living with, we lost an understanding of causality. Specifically, probably most easily uh, cited for this audience, um, David Hume, um, but many of his associates as well, um, effectively said, we don't need causality. There's no way to demonstrate this. It's outside of, of anything that is important for us going forward. And it was the elimination of causality as a result of print that started us in this, this radically uh, reduced in terms of human capabilities. We lost our free will and our agency uh, as a result of losing causality. So if you would care to go back to the origins in the West of our understanding of causality, you wind up with Aristotle, not with Plato. And you wind up with something very interesting, to me at least, when you go into Aristotle's physics and you take a look at his description of the four causes, mm -hmm. if what we call efficient, probably right. should have been called kinetic, but let's mm -hmm. call it efficient, mm -hmm. um, material, final, and then the basis of all of this, formal cause, forms. We lost our understanding of forms as a result. Uh, of this separation between the mind and the body, most conveniently, but not in any way exclusively or even most importantly um, with Descartes. Uh, these set of reductions, these sets of eliminations of what it me really means to be human have been going on in the West now for 400 plus years. So we have a very long history. We have libraries filled with materials. We have massive population of, of people uh, who have been misled. They have lost track. They do not understand how to answer the question, what does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. That now needs to be restored. Mm -hmm. The question is, along with the many possible answers. And the Chinese or Eastern answer to those questions are not the same as the Western answers to those questions. Um, this, this becomes enormously important for today's geopolitics. Mm -hmm. uh, to try to understand what is going on specifically with the Communist Party of China, which turns out you would say, well, let's see, Communist Party of of uh, China, this is a Marxist-Leninist organization, right? Mm -hmm. And Marx and Lenin are Westerners; they're not Chinese. And uh, in fact, uh, how can you possibly say 
that uh, the Chinese Communist Party is anything but uh, yet another um, uh, mistaken uh, 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 direction uh, taken with Western thought. Well, nothing could be farther from the truth. Mm. Yeah. The fact of the matter is that uh, Xi Jinping, not that I'm saying that he is more important than the overall Chinese cultural and civilizational um, system. I use system advisedly here because it uh, even uh, trying to apply the notion of systems, uh, as you and I have discussed, to biological and and life science phenomenon becomes enormously difficult because systems are inherently reductionist, mm-hmm. and you're stripping away all all, all of the, the the juicy stuff, so to speak. <laughs> When you call something a system, mm-hmm. but but this uh, uh, this phenomenon has uh, reached such a, um, a a peak of uh, intense effort, which has now failed, um, that we have the obligation really uh, to go back and and reexamine this. So the, the answer to your question: Why did this happen? To begin with is the printing press, is why this happened. And the separation of mind and body. Mm-hmm. And that, that's just a shorthand for a massive uh, series of integrations, mm-hmm. which is what we're really dealing with. An organism is not a system. An organism is an integration across a wide variety of, of processes, uh, chemical and otherwise. Um, and and so this uh, whole topic has probably best been investigated uh, by Marshall McLuhan. Mm-hmm. McLuhan is now um, experiencing a revival. We've come to the point now where um, uh, the New York Times uh, will print an op-ed in favor of Marshall McLuhan. <laughs> Uh, written by an author who doesn't probably fully understand what he's talking about, but nonetheless, yeah. uh, as we have uh, noted here from the beginning, um, our mothership, and the mothership involves uh, quite a number of people. Um, there's 30-plus uh, fellows at the center. Um, there are uh, many scores of other people who've been working with us on, on other projects, but CSDL is at heart an attempt to bring Marshall McLuhan's work forward into these now no longer modern conundrums. Yeah. So we have, we have been at this process of getting rid of what it means to be a true human and trying to replace it with something clockwork to begin with and later electronic um, and uh, as has just been suggested by Bob here, the uh, the catchphrase, the medium is the message, which is the title of the first chapter of Marshall McLuhan's 1964, Understanding Media. And then with a, uh, a cheeky twist, it becomes the title of the medium is the massage, <laughs> which is the most successful book with Marshall McLuhan's name on the front of it, although it wasn't written by him, in yes. fact. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you will not find Marshall McLuhan's name on the copyright page, yeah. but it, yeah. based on, it was derived from his work, and the massage is an is a excellent way to draw people's attention to this. Um, th- this scholar, um, English professor, University of Toronto, uh, Catholic convert, at the age of 25, uh, has uh, begun to enjoy a a, a real um, awakening here. And we got there first, or a little bit early, I guess, in, in terms of, of the this current situation. But I would highly recommend um, uh, for the listeners that um, McLuhan's work starting with Gutenberg Galaxy, which lays the blame 
that I've been describing here on the printing press, the Gutenberg Galaxy. Uh, more recently, Jeff Jarvis has published an interesting book called The Gutenberg Parenthesis, <laughs> in which he suggests, along with others, that that was a strange thing for us to do and sent us off in a direction that we probably, if we understood what was going on, would not have embraced. Um, but McLuhan then continued, and the one particular work of his that I would recommend for those who are interested in, in delving into this turns out to have been written largely by his son, Eric McLuhan, with whom I was a friend, and uh, was not published until 1980, titled which is The Laws of Media. And the uh, subtitle is The New Science. Mm -hmm. So McLuhan was very thoughtfully engaged with the problem of science and where it was heading in the 1970s, which is when the work behind the, the book published in 1988. Actually, mm -hmm. McLuhan died in 1980. So it's a posthumous, the last of his works. But I highly recommend him. Um, it is based around a heuristic called the Tetrad. The Tetrad itself is based on um, a series of books written by Henri de Lubac, the uh, overarching title of which is Medieval Exegesis. So science in the scribal medieval era in the West began with an understanding that the world had been spoken by God. And as the Gospel of St. John begins the very first sentence, which is read at the end today of every Catholic Mass, I believe, around the world, mm -hmm. um, in the beginning was the Word. Yes. Uh, and so we need to get back to the Word as opposed to the mechanical uh, reproduction of the word word mm -hmm. or the uh, electronic um, subversion, if you will, of the word. And we are already doing this. This is not a, a vain, um, uh, impossible task by any means. Uh, we have been through a sequence of descriptions. Modernity no longer cuts it. Mm -hmm. So we have had postmodernity. We've had meta modernity. We've had a whole series of attempts to say we are somehow surpassing this. Our suggestion would be to simply give up on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why are you trying to portray yourself as modern? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that is that is not where we're heading. Yeah. Um, I didn't finish an earlier sentence. Let me return to it briefly. Xi Jinping, mm -hmm. uh, not, not the most important person in China because the civilization outranks everybody. Yeah. But he is a Chinese classical scholar. Hmm. That's his, that is his personal training. Moreover, and probably even more importantly, his wife, second wife, as it turns out, his wife is the most well-regarded classical Chinese folk singer. Hmm. And perhaps even more importantly, hmm. given how Chinese families tend to operate, Xi Jinping's sister's husband, so that would make it um, uh, his brother-in-law, hmm. has engaged in a radical program to reinterpret, in light of everything that has happened since, Taoism. Hmm. And modern-day Taoists, with whom I've consulted on this, who have read, which is available in Chinese and English, the brother-in-law's work on Taoism, have said this is a massive, massive breakthrough. Makes a huge uh, difference. Uh, it is not very well understood, perhaps, 
another um, aspect which we haven't touched on, and, and I don't intend to get into this in much detail here, given the audience and all the other interesting topics and limited time. But in geopolitical terms, we're, we're now looking at a situation uh, in which the, the, the Chinese have a, a, a foundation which they have retrieved to the extent that not just Chinese classics, which have been taught throughout the entire Chinese educational system. You can think about great books. You can think about a variety of efforts in the West to somehow establish a canon and return to it, which have largely failed. The Chinese have their own canon. Um, high school kids in China today are studying the Tao Te Ching. I have met professors at Peking University who have personally taught members of the Standing Committee of the Politburo, that is the equivalent of the cabinet in Chinese classics. And they didn't stop there, as if that wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. they, have, they have actually begun to teach extensively Western classics. Recently, a few years ago, a complete revision, uh, a new translation of Aristotle into Chinese was mm -hmm. completed. Mm -hmm. They have come to the conclusion that not only is China older than the West, which is accurate, yeah. <laughs> but Western classics undoubtedly, as far as the Chinese are concerned, owe a great deal from the Silk Road, the original Silk Road, transmission of knowledge from the East to the West. Uh, and so they're teaching Western classics as well. So there, there's there more people studying Aristotle today in China than any place else in the world. Absolutely, absolutely remarkable development. We are behind the eight ball in this regard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, speaking of Aristotle, uh, um, you know, like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to this from my, uh, my, my uh, inclination as a biologist. You know, if you, if you look at the Socratic uh, philosophers, uh, Aristotle, by all rights, should be the biologist philosopher you know we should have a biology that is that is uh, uh centered around aristotle's thought and, and yet it it's hard to get science students these days to even you know consider taking a philosophy class it, you know it's it, it's it's as if this this um uh the whole development of the scientific mindset is built around the denial of philosophy you know built around the denial of those of those fundamental uh classical roots of of what it means to be a biologist and and you know you mentioned um uh marshall McLuhan. you know at the in the uh Around the 1950s, you know, there there was this incredible uh, uh, flowering of of uh, of of thought, and of course, uh, Norbert Wiener, who you were uh, you were acquainted with, and with your your father worked closely with. He, he was part of it with the whole development of of cybernetics, and then there's the origin of modern physiology, and this just went through this incredible uh, uh, flourishing of, of, of the idea, which we're still dealing with today in terms of artificial intelligence, that, that the key to understanding life is to treat it as a machine of some sort, as some kind of a, some kind of a mechanism, and, and this is leading to um, uh, almost a moral panic that we're seeing happen around artificial intelligence you know we're we're thinking that uh well it's it seems to be driven by the fact well you know if we make a better machine that thinks uh that's going to somehow be a threat to those of us who actually think when in fact you're talking about entirely different things so so this 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 idea that life is a machine is 
is I think where science has actually gone off the rails in in some significant ways. So, you know, you, you're you're very familiar with the history of of that era. You know, and as I said, it it, uh, it accounted for Norbert Wiener, uh, Gregory Bateson, Marshall McLuhan, um, uh, B. F. Skinner. Uh, you know, the the a whole range of of uh, of of thinkers there that 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 really was the roots of our modern scientific uh well i put that in quotes scientific way of thinking about human beings psychology and all of them seem to have gone off the rails but i wonder as you say but uh i wonder what you can tell us about the history of that i mean you're steeped in in that era and you are very familiar with the uh, sort of dynamics of how all these uh, amazing figures and i also uh, forgot to mention anthony burgess who is in there as well uh, mm-hmm. um you, you know what can you tell us about the flavor of that time? You know, and and uh, it, was, it was very, very contentious and factual, factional. Yeah, there was major fights going on in public uh, between these different points of view, and I think you framed it exactly correctly. So, in particular, if you um, uh, the book Cybernetics was published uh, first by Mar- by uh, Norbert Wiener, by uh, erstwhile godfather, uh, 1948, the year I was born. Uh, as is often the case, as you know, the last thing that gets written in a book is the preface. <laughs> so if you go to the preface in the 1948 edition, original edition of... Um, Cybernetics, you will find a, a remarkable discussion by Norbert Wiener about how he has been, uh, uh, it's been demanded of him by Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead, who were married at the time, mm-hmm. been demanded that he drop everything else and apply cybernetics to controlling society. So we're not going to get into a long discussion here about Bateson. Mm-hmm. It's a complex topic. I'll just simply note that I'm now friends with, um, I think, his only remaining daughter, Nora. Mm-hmm. And Nora has uh, attempted and, and failed to bring these many of these same topics up, which is in particular uh, efforts to promote notions of, of the organic over the systematic and has written a few papers, deliver them, and so forth. But she tells me that nobody wants to hear it about any of that stuff. So, um, but the the specific historic detail I'm happy to put on the record here with Norbert Wiener is that he took the preface to his 1948 cybernetics and expanded it greatly in 1950 in a book titled "The Human Use of Human Beings." Mm-hmm. And that book got him in very serious trouble. Hmm. In particular, the FBI, who had already been questioning his loyalty, wound up, I believe, it's just contrary to some other reports, but based on my own research, the FBI came to Norbert Wiener after he was invited to keynote the um, uh, Walter Reuther's labor union annual conference. So we've got this round, short, Jewish (laughs) academic who has been asked to keynote the most dynamic labor union conference. And the FBI told him not to do that. Hmm. The FBI told him that if he pursued this direction, which would have aligned very much with what you and I are saying today, Mm -hmm. then he, and more importantly, all of his closest colleagues would be called up in front of the House on American Activities Committee, HUAC. Now, Dirk Struick, who was one of Norbert Wiener's friends at MIT, close friend, had gone that route. He'd gone down that that gauntlet. And Struick was a, a publicly declared Marxist. And so the association of him with um, Soviet Union 
um, is an argument that, that was made and basically ruined his life. Wiener was threatened with the same thing. Mm -hmm. So Wiener did not deliver that keynote speech. Um, Wiener effectively withdrew from further publishing. So he didn't die until uh, 64. So we're dealing here with uh, the last decade of Norbert Wiener's life. He has effectively been canceled. And not just canceled by the authorities, but canceled by cybernetics. So I'm not going to hear point fingers at that Gregory Bateson excessively. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but Bateson did not come to Wiener's defense. The rest of the cybernetics community at that point, funded largely by the Ford Foundation, did not come to Wiener's defense. He dropped out of the um, Rockefeller-funded cybernetics group over uh, all of this. And um, he wound up at the very end of his life in 1963, delivering uh, uh, lectures at Yale um, entitled, uh, and, and it actually as it was finally published, um, uh, God and Golem, Inc. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A reflection on how cybernetics impinges on religious matters. Now, wow. Norbert Wiener was not a religious man. He was a secular Jew. But he recognized that what we had lost in this process, this was the same process that gave us modernity. It's the same process that gave us a separation between mind and body. It's the same uh, process that eliminated causality, ultimately winding up with a substitution of statistics, which um, itself is probably a topic that we should talk about in, in one of these yeah. events. Um, is statistics, which of course correlation does not imply causality, yeah. is statistics science? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or is it perhaps something else? And does it perhaps have some other goals? And indeed, the, the specific effort, late 19th, 30th, 20th century, to eliminate causality and replace it with statistics. And this has all been very well do documented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was done by a man who said, we can't control populations. We can't control humans um, the way we've been approaching this. We're going to have to get rid of all of that and substitute statistics, mm -hmm. um, which has been the story, of course, in the in 20th century, yeah. uh, of yeah. science in the 20th century. So we're going to need to very seriously reexamine all of those, all of those relationships. So, Wiener basically was knocked out. Um, there was a uh, a series of uh, of efforts, and I was told by my father that the most important dimension of that was Wiener's fear, not on his own behalf. He would have been quite happy to get on the train and and go to Washington uh, D.C. and and uh, testify in, in front of the House. It was his colleagues that he was worried about. And in particular, I'm not sure that I've ever actually publicly described this, but his closest associate, I would describe as my second godfather, the historian mm -hmm. of science, Giorgio de Saniano. Mm -hmm. Giorgio's the one, as the stereotypical, I guess, Italian romantic, mm -hmm. who brought roses to my mother the day after I was born. That would not be a gesture that Norbert would have thought of, but Giorgio <laughs> did. And Giorgio is a fascinating figure uh, in, in all of this. But um, as it turns out, when um, Norbert Wiener died in, in, uh, in 1964, he was in Stockholm climbing a uh, um, luxurious long set of steps to get to the Queen of Sweden to get an award. <laughs> Mm. And he had a heart attack climbing mm. the stairs. So there's many, many lessons about uh, when the Queen of Sweden yeah. invites you to Stockholm. Think twice <laughs> don't, about don't it. Go. Uh, <laughs> don't go. I wouldn't go. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I was working with my uh, uh, father, who by day was a historian of ancient mathematics, as you've noted. By by 
by night, he was a sports car mechanic. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was helping him to rebuild a racing engine in his shop, the basement, uh, when it came across the radio that Norbert Wiener had died. Hmm. It was the only time I can recall, um, which I guess makes sense, that my father uh, cried. Hmm. I don't remember him witnessing crying, and that would have been unusual, I guess, in other circumstances. Yeah. He turned to me. Yeah. I was 16 at the time. Yeah. He turned to me and he said, Mark, now it's up to you. I said, what? <laughs> Just what you needed. <laughs> yeah. I have been trying um, for, for nearly 60 years since then to mm. figure out what that yeah. meant. But my job to continue the work of Norbert Wiener, as it was understood by his um, protege, my father, um, Bill Stallman, uh, that's very much, in my mind at least, a, a substantial um, foundation mm -hmm. for what we're doing at the center, for what we're doing at Trivue. Uh, and I want to note here that uh, uh, we are going to start the full year's effort for core courses on a quarterly uh, academic schedule beginning in the last week of September, Wednesday, September 25th, um, where we're going to start with the first of the uh, core courses entitled Crisis and Causality. And anybody who is listening or may watch this on YouTube, please go to uh, trivium.university, which is now a TLD, mm -hmm. allowing people to avoid all the regulations associated with EDU, yeah. et cetera. Uh, and um, send me an email info at trivium.university if you'd like to learn more about it. Um, we're actually now beginning uh, to put together our, our initial uh, cohort for the fall, and uh, you're all invited. Yeah, it's a very exciting uh, exciting initiative, and uh, I like the fact that you're sort of uh, skirting outside the uh, the mm -hmm. uh, sort of stifling educational establishment uh, uh, to do this, because it seems like it's the only way that uh, something really innovative can come about. But be <clears throat> before we go on to, to explore what's going on at Trivium University a bit further, um, I want to explore Norbert Wiener a little bit more because he's he's such an unknown and underappreciated figure. Um, you know, I when I was uh, learning about him, you know, I I, um, um, I I came to him because of my my profession as a physiologist, and of course, when you talk about physiology, you must talk about homeostasis and Claude Bernard and all that, and and you know, Wiener wasn't just an engineer. I mean, he was a brilliant engineer, but he, I've I've seen him described as as uh, as as someone who not only gets down to doing it, but also the the very philosophy of of engineering. And at least in terms of homeostasis, he's more he's most uh, well known today for his negative feedback uh, circuits, and and and, the, and it goes far beyond that, of course. But but uh, you, you know, he he was. Uh, when he designed these machines, he was thinking much more deeply than just machines. And, and uh, you know, you mentioned Walter Ruther, uh, and of course he was he was quite a prominent left wing activist himself. You know, I, I mean, I I know that he, uh, he he was the one who sponsored the Port Huron conferences uh, uh, that led mm -hmm. to the foundation of the Students for Democratic Society and and whatnot. And and looking so at Holding, it, it was reported to have written that yeah. uh, Port mm -hmm. Huron statement. And so you're, you're saying that that was in some way fundamentally under his sponsorship. Uh, well, it was. I mean, he he uh, paid for it, right? And uh, and and as I understand it, he actually encouraged Tom Hayden and the other uh, activists of the stu of the SDS to actually do this. And and uh, and and so he uh, offered uh, a lot of support. And, and where this ties in, I think, to um, what we're talking about, uh, you know, you, you, one of the common threads, and we've already mentioned this, is that is that uh, uh, you know you know somehow uh, living things, humans, societies—they're really machines that can be understood through 
correlation and causation. You know, you don't need to look at actual cause and effect as you as you mentioned. And and it seems to me, I, I want to be sure I have this right that 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 somehow the conflict between Norbert Wiener and uh, and 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 others in that realm, where he departed from the kind of cybernetics thing, was that he. He was very clear that life wasn't just a machine; that there was some right. essence there that needed to be uh, accounted for, and um, you know, um, and yet the notion that life is a machine, societies are machines that can be manipulated and controlled by a small group of people, really took off in the 1950s, and right. I'm not sure I'm not sure you can separate that from uh, the rise of of uh, state funding of science you know that 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 no, you can't no, you can't uh, yeah and and in, in, uh, in, in, in fact um uh, as you as you might know but uh, as you're prompting me to fill in some of the details on wiener <laughs> yeah wiener um uh multiple times resigned from mit mm. and his resignations were not accepted mm -hmm. and in that whole process as well as in many publicly published articles, Wiener was aggressively against what he called big science. Yeah. So the demobilization after World War II, which had obviously brought all all scientists were brought into that war effort. All right. The uh, establishment of funding mechanisms from the federal government uh, to keep the uh, plates spinning. Mm -hmm. is something that Wiener was very strongly, uh, very strongly against. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and that, uh, along with these other uh, aspects. So while he was a secular, um, non-religious uh, Jew born in Kansas, um, his father, Leo Wiener, was a philologist and indeed the philologist responsible for uh, establishing Yiddish as a full-fledged language deserving to be studied by philologists. But um, despite the fact that it is not mentioned in um, uh, Masoni's um, uh, really quite limited biography, and there is not a good biography of Wiener still to this day. I, I once threatened to write one, and maybe I will someday. <laughs> but um, despite um, his recounting. The fact of the matter is that Norbert Wiener grew up on Dostoevsky. He grew he grew up on mm. uh, Russian literature because his he was homeschooled by his father, and his father was a Slavic philologist. Mm. And he read Dostoevsky um, in Russian <laughs> as a result of all of this. And so, scattered all throughout Wiener's work, you will see. When it comes to the critical juncture, he says, and we, we must always remember that what we're doing here is for the greater good of God mm. as a, as a non-believer himself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All of that taken together was absolutely enough for him to be sidelined. Uh, and then um, and, and ultimately, uh, as you as you noted, either forgotten or um, as so often happens, mischaracterized. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I'd like to uh, uh, sort of transition to Q and A right now, but but let me just take this opportunity to tell everyone out there in the audience, uh, please do submit your questions. Uh, um, uh, and uh, we already have three teed up, but uh, by all means, uh, 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 add more because this is the funnest part of the uh, of of these conversations. But uh, coming back to Trivium University, you you. Um, you put great emphasis on what you call the three spheres and and uh, and 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 how the three spheres uh, I'm not sure if I'm characterizing this properly but are are going to be the foundation for a new trivium that's going to get us out of the kind of uh, philosophical and intellectual cul-de-sac that we're in right now I wonder if you could uh, tell us a bit more about the three spheres and uh, sure. and how that's going to lead to a new classical 
sure. neoclassical it, education. Um, in, in combination with um, the, the drastic efforts on the part of modern social science to characterize organisms as machines, mm -hmm. the expression of that inclination, which obscures all the important distinctions, which um, in, in fact attempts to build a regime of overall um, uh, control, that was expressed in, and by some it still is, it's the origin of, of the Ukraine war, globalism has been the, the primary theme. It has collapsed. It has failed. Ukraine is, is the, is a, I hope, the final example, if we survive this, the final example of the collapse of globalism. And, <laughs> and, and, and that means we must ask ourselves the question, well, has something already replaced the one world uh, attitude? And our answer to that is yes, the world has already become, in many people's terms, multipolar. Um, uh, Pope Francis likes to call it polyhedral. Uh, I think it's a soccer ball that he has in mind <laughs> when he says that. But we have, um, when asking ourselves the question, um, as important as India is, as important as Japan is, uh, as, as important as Africa is, um, there are only three globally encompassing spheres that can be found in every city and town around the world. And that is East, West, and digital. And the notion that those three would all fall under one uh, overarching globalist framework has already been completely um, discarded. Hmm. The East has a much deeper classical tradition and is now well on its way to training the current generation on these classics. But it has as its overall goal, the Tao, the way, which is a moral description of how human beings and human societies should behave. That's not the same in the West. And the West doesn't have its own equivalent of the Tao, but it does have the virtues. Mm -hmm. And so the West is now in the process of reorganizing itself and orienting towards the virtues, both the classical um, uh, cardinal, uh, four cardinal virtues, but it also the, uh, the later uh, Christian editions of the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Mm -hmm. These don't exist in this form in the East. So we have two global spheres. There's a Chinatown in, in every city in, in the <laughs> U.S. Um, we, we all eat Chinese food. Um, and, and the Chinese uh, also eat hamburgers. Uh, so East and West have two very different views, and that would probably be where it would end. We, we're now in the tradition of Spengler and um, uh, uh, many other, Quigley and, and, uh, and, uh, and even Sam Huntington. Um, what we have done, though, steps beyond what any of those previous theorists of civilizations and the class of civilizations, as Sam Huntington described it, I should note that Sam Huntington uh, was a protege. Uh, I'm sorry, was a mentor to a protege who was my partner, uh, Phil Midland, in, in starting the center. Um, so we're closely uh, linked with uh, that whole civilizational um, uh, uh, confrontation. There is, and that's a two-body problem, and two-body problems have various canonical solutions to them and and, and various uh, approaches have been taken. But when you introduce a third element into this, <laughs> when you introduce 
the digital sphere, which does not have virtue. It does not have the Tao. Instead, it has God-like qualities for humans, hmm. the spark of the divine as its overall goal, which in Western theology would probably typically be associated with Gnosticism, the, if you will, the evil twin mm -hmm. of Christianity, uh, even dating before Christianity, having uh, Jewish origins, uh, or Hebrew, uh, rather, origins. Um, the uh, These three spheres are now in conflict. And much of what you see um, in terms of particularly the way the Chinese dealt with uh, Alibaba, uh, Jack Ma no longer lives in China. He now mm. lives in Japan. Mm. Um, or the way that uh, um, the West uh, has been attempting um, uh, through ethics committees to design ethics for AI, which is really quite Absurd. stupid. Absurd. Really quite stupid. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, the three-body problem as a, uh, as a cosmological phenomenon has no canonical solutions. Hmm. This is the reason why the um, uh, appropriately um, celebrated uh, Chinese science fiction writer, um, you might not be surprised to hear, there really isn't a science fiction in, mm. in China. Fiction of, of that sort doesn't quite work. There are interesting mythologies that children are raised with and, and so forth. But Shishin Lu, the author of a book titled The Three-Body Problem, which is the first of a trilogy, mm -hmm. the title of the trilogy is Remembrance of Earth's Past. And the conceit in there is a um, extraterrestrial uh, civilization that is living in a, in a world in which there are three suns hmm. and uh and the 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 uh inevitable destruction associated with the uh these three gravitational bodies um uh, uh colliding with each other so we have ourselves uh we're we're in as uh i, I guess it would be uh laurel and hardy would say well, this is a, this, this is a fine kettle of fish. <laughs> so, is it the uh, is is the uh, is the challenge ahead to somehow uh, tame this this uh, this uh, digital sphere to actually somehow integrate it with uh, either the Eastern or the Western uh, um, ideas, which has which both have at its heart something deep about the nature of of uh, humanity, whereas the digital sphere is a sort of soulless, amoral uh, system. Right. Is is the challenge to be to integrate that into into Eastern or Western thoughts, or is there I, the way I would describe it, could come out of it? The, the way I would describe it is that perhaps our our best opportunity is in fact not to integrate not to wage war but rather to synchronize uh -huh. so developing a high enough level understanding about the characteristics of these three spheres in all places Followed by then uh, a, a, a kind of an effort to bring together the uh, um, proponents in various forums and so forth. Um, but it, I think we're far, at this stage at least, we're far more in a situation of having to understand the three spheres mm -hmm. than we are to try to collapse them. Yes, if it were possible, for Elon Musk, whose biography uh, uh, is about to appear, um, uh, and it's not going to be a, uh, a judging on, on what we've seen so far. It, it's it, um, the, the author, of course, um, is West. So this this and, and Elon is digital sphere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're about to be treated to a biography written by the West sphere. Hmm. About the digital sphere. Okay. So therefore, it has to be hostile. Okay. Uh, as opposed as as opposed to one which is far more fundamental. Yeah. And 
and an attempt to actually understand what's going on here. Um, uh, Elon is a smart enough guy. And uh, as has recently been illustrated in in various of his activities and and public uh, approaches and so forth, uh, I know some of the people, uh, I don't know him myself personally. I'm I'm older than that generation. So I go back to um, people in the 80s and 90s and and so forth, who in turn wind up in some cases being mentors to people like uh, Musk. But I know a bunch of people who are around Musk. And he really needs to upgrade those conversations. Mm-hmm. It, it, yeah. it really has to get beyond the, um, the, the sort of dorm room, uh, pass the bong, uh, uh, sort of, <laughs> of speculative gee whiz. Wouldn't it be great to do this? Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, it may well be, he has started a, a company, um, uh, which simply has the URL x.ai. And he's declared that that company's purpose is to understand what is really going on in the universe. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that's going to be the kind of philosophy that that you and I would suggest necessarily, Mm -hmm. but it could be. Mm. So to to begin with x.ai, a a, a perfect um, digital sphere enterprise, uh, appears to be setting out to, to be a super version of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So that what's really going on in the universe could simply be um, we need to meet the aliens. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? We, we really need to meet each other yeah. Yeah. first yeah. before yeah. we set out to meet yeah. the, the aliens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, synchronize is the is the word of the hour here that uh, I've I've taken away from this. So uh, we have a number of comments that have uh, come into the chat and the Q and A. Let me just uh, let's just go to to uh, to to some of those. Uh, 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 M Nasca, for example, in the Q and A. Um, uh, asks uh, if the printed and distributed word was the problem, where would modern science have been without it, and humanity without science driving technology? And right. and uh, I think uh, uh, this person is 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 trying to uh, ask you to fill in, you know, why right. is why, why is the printed word particularly the problem? Uh, well, the first obvious answer to your question is if. That had not happened, we would still have souls. Mm-hmm. So, okay. um, we if, if that had not happened, then we would not have been forced to make the Faustian bargain. Okay, and sell our souls, but we did. And the Faustian bargain gave us all of these benefits um, from from science. Um, and and I'm not complaining um, about that, uh, as you noted. Uh, uh, before I'm surrounded by, and I, I tend to collect uh, uh, objects, um, uh, some cameras, some computers, and, and so forth. I'm I'm not a luddite. Um, uh, I'm I'm, but on, on the other hand, I, I want us to very seriously question exactly how many cashmere sweaters do we need, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and what happens to a world driven out of the print revolution, and I'll get to answer the question on print more specifically, but what happens to a world that has been organized around um, endless growth when the growth stops? Because mm-hmm. it has. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're on an S-curve, and we're, we're way up on the plateau here. Yeah, the logistics, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, logistics so curve. The logistics curve, the... Mm-hmm. the uh, Exactly. The sigmoid curve, which is where the S in S yeah. curve comes from. So so we've been at this long enough that, that we, we now need to take stock. But yeah. the direct answer to the question is that by moving from scribal uh, to print, we did a number of things. We, first of all, required that... Um, writing be paid for. 
Now, that shift to a commercial basis for writing, as exhibited in the Frankfurt Book Fair and all the rest of this uh, printing presses and all this press and so forth arising, I once went to the um, what may be one of the world's largest antiquarian uh, book sales in New York City, in the armory, um, and I had a particular goal. I went around to those people who were selling um, material on vellum. They were they were selling, uh, which turned out to mostly be medieval music, mm-hmm. but but people who were selling in canabula, very early print as well. And I said to them one after another, what percentage of material knowledge that we had in the scribal era wound up being successful enough that it got printed? The answer was uniform. 5%, maybe 10%. 90% of human effort in knowledge was lost. And so the reason why print was the problem, and this this is the diverging uh, trajectories of China and the West, is the most obvious way to see this, is that for all the benefits, which I'm not disputing, um, lifespan and medicine and beyond, that we got as a result of becoming modern, we now need to consider, since we have completed that process, that's not going to go on forever. There is no such thing as an exponential in reality. It winds up being second order growth. It winds up having its limits built into the equation. I once actually had a conversation with Ray Kurzweil about this. And I said, Ray, you're a mathematician, right? Yes, Mark, I'm a mathematician. Good. So then you know that if you concatenate S-curves, you pile one on top of another and another, another, Mm -hmm. what you get is just a big S-curve. Yeah. (laughs) There are no exponentials involved in this. He looked me in the eye and he said, Mark, I know you're right, but I have an audience. (laughs) And my audience is in Silicon Valley. Yeah. And my audience wants to hear about exponentials, even if they don't exist. Yeah. <laughs> but we're coming to the point of recognizing they don't exist. And print is what set us on that road. Digital is what is pulling us back okay. uh, from all of that. Because digital forces us to ask these questions. Okay. Digital forces us to deal with the three-body problem. Digital forces us to ask the question, what, is, what does it mean to be human? Yeah. Uh, and digital forces us to retrieve what was done before the printing press. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, uh, in, in some other uh, podcasts and webinars, uh, uh, either you or Fred Beitler uh, mentioned that uh, Socrates never wanted to write anything down because he thought it would, uh, it would uh, uh, degrade the human quality of memory, which is how, you know, uh, people communicate with one another, how traditions are passed on and so forth. So are you saying that the invention of the printing press was just compounding that, 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 that basic problem that, that, that we've lost our ability to communicate and to, uh, and to foster the um, existence of the soul or the psyche? as you say is is it kind of the same thing but order of magnitude worse or yes there there are orders of magnitude involved here but the the presentation by um in in the in the words of uh, socrates in the phaedrus Mm -hmm. written by plato um uh, that uh conversation between thoth and the pharaoh um it was the pharaoh who suggested to thoth as recounted by Socrates, <laughs> that uh, this would destroy our memory. Well, that that it did actually destroy our oral memory, mm-hmm. which is why the poets are not allowed in in Plato's Republic. Yeah. Okay. All right. Interesting. That that was the oral paradigm. Yeah. However, what that meant was that a new configuration of human memory now needed to be developed. Yeah. And it yeah. was. Um, the printing press, um, in in very serious terms, um, was an assault on that scribal memory. Yeah. 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 And then the electric paradigm, 
which all of us, presuming that there aren't um, any really young people uh, at the moment, at least listening to this, um, we're all old enough to have grown up in electric paradigm. Yeah. And the electric paradigm scrambled our eggs um, even worse. So yeah. what what digital does. So so here's here's perhaps the, the important point here. A television set and television has, has been the technology that has largely defined the world that we lived in. Um, I didn't grow up with a television set. I was taught uh, um, cuneiform. I, I was I was writing Babylonian at the age of eight. But my father taught me how to do um, cuneiform. But um, television is an illusion machine. Yeah, that, that's its only purpose is illusion. Yeah. There is no picture. There are no colors. There's no movement. It's it's all an optical illusion. Uh, the basis of the technology of digital is memory. We all know this. We we know that when you go out and buy a computer or iPhone or whatever, the only choice you really have, increasingly, you may be able to choose colors, but not not really. Is how much memory you're going to put in the thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the fundamental architecture, the grammar of digital technology is memory, not illusion. Yeah, yeah. And, and so this compels us to re-examine exactly the question that Socrates brought up. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we're going to destroy television memory. Yeah, yeah. The memory associated with make-believe, the memory associated with optical illusions, that memory has already been dramatically undermined. Hmm. Mm. And since memory is inherent to the human psyche, it's one of the key inner senses, as we would describe it, that means, puts the onus on us to develop a richer um, and, and, and far more um, uh, capable and far more uh, intentional and, and far more supportive of our agency understanding of memory and we're we're doing that right now mm, yeah yeah i mean certainly scribal that is writing things down and engages the engages the mind in a far different way from just reading something and right. and e even worse by watching a television screen which just passes in and out of my short-term memory whenever i do it and uh, so let's let's try and get to some more of these uh more of the questions are they're starting to stream in a little bit uh um, so, um, uh, Dave Peterson asks an, an interesting one. Uh, uh, if, if you have any comments or insights on the relation of Abe Maslow and others in the humanistic psychology movement from hmm. 1940 to 1970, how does hmm. how does he fit hmm. in? I'll answer that very briefly. In fact, I'll try to answer every question more briefly now because we're we're coming toward the end here. We it turns out that Abe Maslow came to recognize that his hierarchy of needs was the destruction of human life. Hmm. Turns out that Abe Maslow, I know this because of one of his protégés, who I work with very closely, he spent the last decade of his life trying to undo the mistake that he had made. Hmm. Hmm. And, and so humanistic psychology without a soul is not humanistic psychology. The, the notion that, that we would wind up in the end uh, pursuing uh, uh, self-actualization at the peak of the pyramid when um, Abe Maslow had a chance to think that through when he saw I, the, the man who helped me with this actually is the one who made Abe Maslow famous by bringing him into psychology today so he was the editor of psychology today um, and I worked closely with him for a number of years uh, it, it turns out that Abe Maslow recognized that he had made a terrible mistake. Mm -hmm. And that terrible mistake can be expanded into Eric Erickson, can be expanded into a number of people who would be called uh, humanistic psychologists. That's all television. Mm -hmm. Abe figured that out. And very few people recognize that he spent nearly 10 years trying to undo the mistake oh. he made. Interesting. Okay. Courageous act on his part. Uh, uh, turning to some of the uh, questions here. Um, uh, end user, who uh, is, I guess is anonymous, uh, uh, says, uh, 
with respect to statistics, I, I think one uses math to do statistics, but how one complies and presents them may be affected by their biases. Uh, so I think uh, what this person is saying is that uh, statistics is is uh, unusually prone to to being uh, uh, um, influenced uh, unduly by someone's preconceived ideas. Do you think that's true? I do. Um, in fact, um, uh, figures lie and liars figure. Um, but uh, every Science, everyone who I would call a, a real scientist, and I, I, I've met um, maybe a hundred of them uh, throughout my career, they've all had the same thing to say about statistics. Um, never, never rely on statistics uh, to understand what's going on, yes. but use statistics to test what yeah. you have sorted out. Yeah. So this this, this distinction between actually coming to grips with the underlying situation, which is ultimately a subconscious process. We call it philosophical, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it is an activity of the psyche, attempting to pull together an understanding of structures, relationships, and processes. That then can be tested. It can be uh, thrown against the wall, so to speak, and to see how well it sticks. Mm -hmm. But yeah. You can't start with statistics. Um, you, you're, and and the the uh, reality of biases coming in. Um, so we we all have some training in statistics. We all know what curve fitting uh, looks like. We've all yeah. read, the, read the various articles about this, and it turns out that a a, a scatter of dots um, you can you can fit pretty much any curve you want to. Uh, to depending on how you adjust the parameters, and that's where the biases uh, come into all this. So, no, just, just uh, re reserve some of these activities to judge how well you understand things and whether it actually sticks against the wall or not, but yeah. do not use it for fundamental understanding. Yeah, d definitely true. I mean, it's uh, and uh, just uh, let's let's uh, wrap up with um. Uh, something that uh, a couple of our uh, listeners have uh, pointed out. Uh, uh, first of all, that uh, we shouldn't, uh, uh, when we're talking about uh, Jewish and Hebrew philosophers, we shouldn't neglect Maimonides. And uh, uh -huh. another, and another user mentions that Norbert Dwiener was actually related to Maimonides. So yes, he was. So, he was a direct descendant well, of Maimonides. Uh -huh. who was often referred to uh, by the um, uh, relatively more uh, devout as the Rambam and and the uh, guide for the, to the perplexed and, and other materials. It turns out that Maimonides was very self-consciously an Aristotelian. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. And, and, and so uh, the, whoever commented in that direction is 100% correct. Um, we should not forget the Rambam. Um, and in, in reading the Rambam, we should also make sure that we have Aristotle uh, alongside. Um, this, this is, uh, um, Aristotle, of course, had largely been, been lost. Um, and uh, uh, as in fact, Plato had been lost also. So um, uh, something typically referred to as Neoplatonism, arises that, that is a, a, a fusing of, of Aristotle and, and Plato um, mm -hmm. for people who don't actually have the original materials. It wasn't really uh, until uh, the 13th century that much of this material began to reappear, and it reappeared um, in, in large part because of uh, Arab um, uh, translations, and the Arab translators um, were often uh, Hebrews. Uh, and so, um, uh, Maimonides' uh, uh, role in um, in Spain uh, and later in Egypt, um, uh, we shouldn't forget any of these elements. We're 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 now being tasked to um, perform uh, what's called net assessment. Digital net assessment is what Exogenous Inc. does because we're now in a digital paradigm, but we. We really can't eliminate um, any of these contributions, and, and indeed, um, uh, with my Jewish friends, and, and we, we actually have a project underway now 
um, to try to answer the question, what will current day Jewish intellectuals do around their own history and traditions of the golem hmm. uh, in relationship to AI. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I haven't got anything to report yet uh, in all this, but I have a few uh, scholars that I'm working with uh, on that topic. And I, my guess, my, my guess is that Maimonides uh, uh, will uh, feature importantly in that discussion. Great. Great. Okay. Well, we've reached the end of our time. Uh, as you say, let's just uh, wrap things up. Uh, again, a bit more housekeeping on this end. Uh, we weren't able to get to all of the questions. So I apologize for that. Uh, uh, if you um, if you would like, you're welcome to submit your questions to me at my email address. That's turner at nas.org. And I will do my best to see that you get an answer. Uh, I'll probably forward those questions on to you, Mark. And uh, you can also add comments to the YouTube uh, uh, recording of this um, of this webinar, which will uh, show up on YouTube uh, very soon after after we're done. And then just one final thing. Uh, uh, we do a lot of webinars here at the National Association of Scholars. Uh, I've uh, dropped into the chat box uh, while we still have time. Um, we have, I think, five coming up over the next uh, two weeks. So please do have a look at that. And of course, we invite you to uh, come to any of those. And uh, Mark, thanks very much for this uh, really interesting and wide ranging discussion. Uh, um, uh, pay attention to Trivium, uh, you know, Trivium U. Uh, the links are in the chat uh, box up near the top. And uh, um, again, uh, Mark, thank you. And I will uh, leave the last word to you. Uh, Scott, um, we have a mutual friend who introduced us uh, a couple of months ago. Yes, Bill Frizzo. Uh, and, and we've had nothing uh, but a great time yeah. uh, ever since then. Um, Bill Bill knew exactly uh, that he was doing the right thing. And, and so I, I encourage uh, everybody here uh, to spread the word, make yes. introductions, get, yes. get people together with each other, even if you think they may have... Uh, or, or may think they have uh, some uh, big deal uh, disagreements. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully they'll find out that they don't. Hopefully they'll find out that, yeah. that in fact, they have a lot of work to do together. And, and that is that is true uh, for the two of us, as well as uh, for your audience. I encourage everybody to get involved. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's not a competition. Uh, so, all right, with that, uh, thank you very, very much, Mark. Uh, it was wonderful. And uh, again, uh, to all the people who came, thank you for your questions. And uh, do have a look at the YouTube uh, video that's going to come up and share. Reach out to your friends and colleagues. Okay. Thanks again, Mark. We'll, Thanks.